We are now on to chapter three. Um, this is another little bit of a hodgepodge chapter to get you oriented before we then move to the individual body systems. Um, but this is going to cover all of your directional terms, your body planes, certain positions, regions, and quadrants. It's very important because if doctors and nurses aren't on the same page with, you know, a position for a procedure or which side of the body to do the surgery on or to assess where the pain is, then you're in real trouble. So everyone needs to be on the same page with these terms so we really understand the location of the issue. Um, to break it down a little bit, the directional terms are kind of where one body part is to another. An anatomic plane is used to identify certain structures. It's kind of imaginary lines that cut through the body. This is often used a lot when you're doing different kinds of diagnostic scan procedures. And then finally, the body positions are really used to communicate how a patient needs to be situated for different procedures or treatments or recovery, that kind of thing. And then finally, just to help orient things for physical exams, you can break up the abdominopelvic section into a few different regions. So you can break it up. There's nine different regions. Or if you want to make them a little bit larger, you can also break them up into quadrants. It just kind of depends on how someone uses it, but we'll, we'll show you both. All right, anatomic position. This is the standard way that every doctor kind of views what this is. And it's standing with your feet shoulder width apart and your palms facing outward. Um, that is what we call anatomical position, whether the person is standing up physically or if they are lying down with their face up. All of these directional terms that we're going to see are the same. I did give a diagram to kind of help you. You can either pick up a hard copy or you can look at the electronic version, but I recommend just having this and then maybe labeling it to study for where these different terms are. All right. So first we're going to start with those directional terms and then I suggest that you practice labeling the figure. It's on page 60 of your book to kind of help you. Antero means front. So when you're talking about the anterior side of a person, you are talking about their front, their stomach side, which is going to be a little bit silly because at the end of the list, ventro means belly, but that also really is front. So anterior and ventral mean very, very similar things and are sometimes used interchangeably. Um, caudo means tail or downward. So if something is caudal, it's kind of toward the tail. You might, if you've had anatomy and physiology, then you use caudal a lot when you're talking about the tail of an animal. Cephalo is the opposite. It means head or upward. Um, cephalo is, means kind of brain, so that's why it is up towards the head. A lot of times people might use cranio too for that directional term, and that's okay. Disto, like distance, means away. And what that means is kind of away from where it's attached to the body. Most of the time you're going to use it with arms and leg type of thing where it's, you know, your hand is distal to your elbow, meaning that it's farther away from where your arm attaches to your body. Dorso, like the dorsal fin on a shark or a fish, means back. So it's the opposite of ventro, which means belly. Uh, you'll also see that postro means back as well. Um, usually the way that the pairs kind of work, we use dorsal and ventral to mean back and front, and then you might use anterior and posterior to mean front and back in that term. I don't know why, that's just how it is. Infra means below, like if something is inferior, it is below or located below. Lateral means to the side, so those who like to work out, your lats are on the side. 
um, medio middle, that's towards the midline of the body. Uh, poster already covered. Proximo is the opposite of disto. So proximo means towards the midline or point of attachment of the body. And supero means above. So that is the opposite of infero. They kind of go in pairs. I would recommend taking a moment and working on the figure just to, to label it a little bit and get a, a visual on what that looks like. Um, this is that diagram. So looking through, um, a head would be cephalo. Um, we have back and front. And then right below that you see back, behind, and belly. So again, so oftentimes they get used interchangeably. In this case, I would say back and front would be posterior, anterior, and then the below that would be the dorsal ventral. Again, the answer key is in Appendix A. You can always check yourself. Tail means, in this case, tail of the spine because we're humans and don't have real tails. Caudal, caudo, excuse me. Um, above would be supero, where the opposite Below would mean infero. I don't even see that on here. Oh, it's at the bottom. Um, side would be latero. Middle would be medio. And then near and away would be proximo and disto. We have a couple suffixes and prefixes to add to the list, just to talk whether you're talking about one or two sides. By I'm guessing you know that means two, like a bicycle has two wheels, and uni means one. So this is going to be, you know, whether you're talking about pain or an issue on both sides or one size on the body. Um, suffixes, AD and IOR. Um, IOR is another one you can add to the list that means pertaining to. In Chapter 2, we saw IC, AL, and OUS. All of those meant pertaining to, so does IOR. But AD means a little bit different. It means toward. So if you're going toward the head, toward the tail, toward the outside of the body, that kind of thing. It's a, it does not necessarily mean the exact same thing as pertaining to. All right, which one of these is a prefix? It's pretty basic. A is the right answer. I'm guessing that was a, a quick and easy one for you. All right, now we're going to put words together. And most of them are what I've kind of been saying all along because it's easier to make full words than it is to just say the combining forms. Um, but this might be something that you want to mark on your own diagram, the directions to kind of help you. If it has an AD ending, then that means it's talking about toward. If it has the AL ending, then that means it's pertaining to. So if I said cephalid, that means toward the head. If I say caudid, that means toward the tail. Um, other things, it's incorporating the prefixes in there. So if I'm talking about unilateral, I'm pertaining to just one side, whereas bilateral would be pertaining to both sides. Um, mediolateral would be pertaining to both the middle and the side. Um, also here we have inferior, superior. You can see the abbreviations. Um, caudal and cephalic. So before we had caudid, which means toward the tail, caudal means pertaining to the tail. It gets a little tricky because you can see they're kind of using different suffixes to mean pertaining to, and that's okay. Um, you're not necessarily always going to remember which one is the right one, so as long as you put the a suffix that means pertaining to, then I won't consider it incorrect. Um, at the end here, we have antero-posterior and posteroanterior, that is often used, let me see if I, 
in situations like this. It has to do with how maybe a scan is projected, whether it's from front to back or from back to front. In this case, it's from back to front, so you would say posterior anterior projection or a PA. Whereas if the person flipped over, then you would have the front to back projection, and that would be anteroposterior or AP if you wanted to abbreviate it. Okay, review, which one means two sides? Hopefully we are thinking C, bilateral. We've officially got all the directions down, so now we're gonna move to the planes. And there is some pictures in your book as well as some kind of actual scan pictures to help you see what those are. So here we have the different planes. In this case, we have um, the one that cuts you in half, so you have a front half and a back half. That would be the frontal plane. It's also called the coronal plane because it kind of cuts through the crown of the head. Um, those are used interchangeably. They mean the same thing, however you want to remember it. Um, transverse plane cuts you into a top and the bottom. So you can see in this picture it cuts through the waist. And then if you're cutting into right and left pieces, then you would say sagittal. If you're cutting into, you know, equal right and left halves, then that would be mid-sagittal because you're right in the middle there. In your book, it, there's um, a couple of different terms there. There's going to be mid-sagittal, so that means you have an equal right and left half. Parasagittal, which means that you have unequal right and left halves. And the more generic, just sagittal, means you're cutting into right and left pieces. Here's a picture of what some of those look like. So on the left, you have the frontal or coronal slice. In this case, these are MRI images. So you have kind of a slice image. You can kind of see um, the, the head and shoulders of the person. Um, Mid-sagittal means that you are in right and left side, so you can see kind of the profile on the side. And then transverse is cutting into top and bottom halves, so you can kind of see what that looks like. All right. Finally, we have body positions before we move to quadrants and regions. Body positions, again, are more for communicating patient positions for certain procedures and surgeries and things like that. The first one is called the orthopenia position. And this one is sitting upright. You can see exactly what it looks like in the picture, supported by pillows. So usually it has to do with, you know, your straight back or you tilt a little bit forward. Um, and this specific position is needed for things like a thoracocentesis. Um, or if you have fluid in your lungs or something in your lungs and they need to actually suck that out, this is the position that that is. Um, recumbent means lying down. And there are different types of recumbent positions. I also think of like the recumbent bicycle, if you've ever seen those, where the person kind of looks like they're laying back and they're bicycling. You can Google it. Um, but there's different types of recumbent positions. Supine is the top, and that's where you're lying down, but you are lying down on your back face up. So this could also be called the dorsal recumbent position. Uh, if you are lying prone, then you're lying down with your front on the ground, and that's the ventral recumbent position, or prone. Uh, and then there are different types of lateral recumbent positions, and these are when you're on the right and left side. Um, and you can kind of just see your, they're laying down whether it's on one side or the other for various reasons. The other positions that we're going to encounter, the Fowler position, um, 
this is where you're sitting a little bit. It's kind of like semi-sitting with semi-elevation of the knees. It's the typical position that you might find yourself on a stretcher. Um, lithotomy position is lying back, hips up, flexed, and rotated. Sometimes they're in those stirrups. It's the kind of baby having or examining position. The Sims position, uh, there's pictures in your books of these on page 71, but that's where you're lying on your side and you have your right knee up and your um, arm back. And it's a very specific position that's specifically used usually for lumbar punctures when they need to take some of the fluid out of your spinal column. And the Trendelenburg, that's when you're on kind of a tilt board and your head goes below your feet, whether it's to get more blood flow to your head or some other reason. It's called the Trendelenburg position, which you can see a lot of these are eponyms named after the person who discovered or named these positions. All right. So here on the left, you can see that semi-sitted, you can see it's kind of at an angle. It's hard to tell, but the knees are slightly elevated of what that position would be. But that is the um, thinking, thinking, Fowler position. And on the right, you have the tilted with your head below your feet. That is the... Trendelenburg, and yes, you will have to spell those correctly. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these are eponyms, so you can see these people that discovered these different positions. All right, moving to the final portion of this particular chapter, we get to the abdominopelvic regions and quadrants. So this is what the different regions are broken down into. Um, it's a little bit arbitrary lines, but you kind of get the idea. So we start in the center with the umbilical. Think of your belly button, your umbilicus. Uh, so that's why it is called that. Then up above we have epigastric because it is above the stomach. Um, you can kind of see here's your stomach. And above that, we have the epigastric. You can kind of see the organs pictured behind. I'm never going to ask you what organ is in what region or quadrant. Uh, I just want you to know where they are. So epigastric is above the stomach. And then hypo means below or under, so under gastric. That's kind of the middle. And if we're remembering anatomic position, we have left and right. And those always are in reference to the patient. So even though these are on the right side of us, as we look at this picture, it's the left side of the patient. So that's why we use it that way. Um, and then the right is on the other. So the way that this works is that we have similarly named just right and left. In this case, hypochondriac. And that sounds really weird because, you know, a hypochondriac as we know it today is someone who just thinks that they're sick with everything. But that's not always what it used to mean. Um, chondro means cartilage. So hypochondriac means pertaining to under the cartilage. And it was originally referenced to kind of pertain to the cartilage of the ribs. And so that's why it's called that, is because it's under the rib area. So we have the left and right hypochondriac. And then we have the right and left lumbar. So if you think about the lumbar section or the lower back section of your vertebrae, that's why it's called that. And then you get down to the hip area where you have your iliac sections. And if you think about your iliac bone, if you know where that is, part of your hips, um, that's why it's called that. So those are your different anatomico-pelvic regions, excuse me, abdominopelvic regions. Um, and that's really to help certain doctors and nurses communicate about where a pain is, where a procedure is, that kind of thing. You can also separate by quadrant. Sometimes that's a little bit easier, sometimes it's not, but it's a little bit more straightforward. You use your belly button or umbilicus as that center point, 
and you just draw a vertical and horizontal line and you create four equal sections. Um, here is how they are named. So again, the right and the left piece is in reference to the patient's right and left. Then you mention whether it, you are talking about upper or lower. So it's direction first, then upper or lower, and then quadrant. And all of them have abbreviations. So if you're talking about pain in the large portion of the liver, then you would say this person has pain in the right upper quadrant, or R-U-Q. It's a stomach problem, then it's probably in the left upper quadrant, or L-U-Q. So those are those four quadrants. All right. So that brings us really to the end of the chapter where it's just kind of recapping what your abbreviations were. Um, this is on page 76 of your book to give you an idea of what those are in terms of body directional terms. Four of them were just on the last slide. And at the very end again, I always encourage you to go through and read the different pronunciation pieces. Um, I think I took some of these from the ninth edition, but they might be, this one is in your book as well on page 80. And there's also that quiz at the end that I think would be very helpful with the answers in the back. Um, these same types of true false questions are located in your book to kind of help you. Here I've kind of given you another procedure just to help. Um, the PowerPoints like to give little things at the end of how you might want to palpate arterial pulses. So these are the different places where you can actually feel a pulse and you can see how they are named based on direction. Okay, here are some review questions. So we have the temporal pulse is palpated. Thinking about where the temporal is, it's kind of hard because we haven't learned the specific bodies, but your temporal has to do with your temples or your head. The radial pulse is palpated on the wrist. And these are just fun facts. I'm not going to quiz you on this. Femoral pulse, you can see, is located in the thigh area by the femur. And that brings us to the end. So you've successfully completed all of Unit 3, or Chapter 3, all of Unit 1.